So, yeah. So, who has... Has anybody else seen God's Not Dead 2? No. no. Monty hasn't seen it either. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Goodness. Well, this movie, it, all of these God's Not Dead movies are based on actual court cases and actual occurrences. There's hundreds of them, probably thousands of them. And so, this brings up the, um, the church and state thing. We have a thing here in the United States, a separation between church and state. Pretty much most of these kind of things are reactions. I mean, throughout Christian history, in Europe, a lot of Europe is burned out on this church and, and state stuff where they had churches ruling the country. <laughs> He's very excited. <laughs> He's like, wow, <laughs> what happened? So, in the United States, it's a separation of church and state, but these kind of laws get carried out in kind of extreme cases. So, whereas the first God's Not Dead movie, did anyone see that one? Yeah, yeah that was one with the professor and the, the student comes and, and basically all the, the students in the philosophy class have to write out um, God is dead and signed the paper to skip over the problem of God. But in this one we have a school teacher, not not at the university level, but uh, a school teacher uh, who basically wants to be truly helpful and is using some examples of, of throughout history of different uh, people and teachers and and happens to throw Jesus in the mix and happens to share a line or two uh, from the Bible, I believe, and then that's where all the attention and the hammer comes down. Uh, so, it's going to be, that's the, the backdrop theme, but really, I think it's very much like the first movie, and it's just going inside and getting in touch with, with values, because it's not so much a religion or no religion, or, or trying to uh, keep religion and education apart, um, which is, which is you know, they do have parochial schools in the United States that are private schools, but in terms of public schools you're supposed to keep church, religion, and then education apart. So that's going to be the, the underlying theme, but really um, it's more like it's, you can see it in the characters, the main character, and then uh, some of the students, um, they start to get in touch with, I think you could say it's their calling, and um, you know, we just had a beautiful movie yesterday, a documentary movie, which we followed this band, it started out in a basement in Australia, and then have gone worldwide uh, with their church and their band, and, and I think you could see in some of the documentary scenes of the of the different band members um, being called and called by God, they would say, and then this is the fruition of that call is um, going deeper and deeper into to being used by God. And I think for for this teacher and the students, uh, it also brings in um, she has a good relationship with. Uh, her father, and tries to talk things through with him. Does anybody remember Pat Boone? Mm -hmm. Pat Boone, he was very, and uh, his daughter, Debbie Boone, she had a big hit, You Light Up My Life. This is the father, It plays. he plays the father of the teacher in this, and so he's, he has some of his influence, but you can see with the students, they have to really start to take a close look at at their own belief systems and what they value, very much like the first God's Not Dead movie where the young man has to decide. He can't, in all of his in good conscience, sign the paper that God is dead, and in the end ends up 
having to get more and more in touch with what his beliefs are and his feelings and 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 I would say underneath it the calling. So this is a good movie for answering the call. And at the end the students have to make up their minds uh, about the teacher, whether they support the teacher or not and and how far are they willing to go in supporting the teacher and and acting out what they feel is very strong inside. And I think that's, even with Course in Miracles students, you know, people can immerse with the book, and then it comes a point where there is going to be kind of like trying to just teach the Course intellectually and hold on to the status quo, which is personhood and the world and families and institutions and so on and so forth. Or, as the Apostles were called to do, to let go of everything in the world and actually move towards the Christ light and the Christ experience. So this movie is more at the at the introductory levels of, of those that have a strong calling in terms of their faith and um, yeah, in terms of a of a teacher having to look at her principles and then um, being threatened with you either uh, recant on these things and um, kind of cave in and give way, or or you're fired. And uh, you know this isn't quite as extreme as the Cathars in the Pyrenees, where they were told recant your position and accept the Catholic Church's position or burn in that fire right over there. Not quite that extreme, but you never know, pure flicks, they might come out with <laughs> that someday we could have the Cathars <laughs> by pure flicks and you know, because that was very much taking the stand for the mystical Jesus, I'd say. And um, in one sense that's what our daily lives are about too. And like the Apostles giving ourselves over completely. So I think this is one of those, it's a, definitely a God movie, it's got a God vibe in it, like Touched by an Angel always has like a, a God vibe there. This has got the God vibe and, and again it's based on actual court case, actual, or actual um, cases that they've just decided to make a movie out of. So, so for those of you that got to watch the, the movie Yesterday, this will be your second Pure Flix movie in a row. Back to back Pure Flix. Okay, let's roll them. <laughs> and if she's found liable, which she will be. Fire American the Civil Liberties Union. Union. Amer ACLU is American Civil Liberties Union. The, the Civil Liberties Union will be the ones who can yeah. her? Yes. <laughs> civil Liberties, protecting That's... liberties, the freedom of individuals against things like religion. So that's what they're formed for. So that's a very powerful organization. So the bo school board is going to try to pass the buck and just say, we, we say take hands off and then we let this American Civil Liberties Union, ACL, come in and do the, the dirty work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe name this co-defendant. We don't have the financial wherewithal to fight that. They've already been in touch. That we submit copies of our sermons for the last three months for review. Can they do that? These are all the ministers in the town. All the ministers in the town have been subpoenaed to submit their sermons for the last three months. So, think about that. If you're a minister <laughs> getting a a subpoena from a court that you have to, and now we'll hear why do they want to subpoena all the uh, the sermons for the last three months, word for word. This is why we have Alan Virtual. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
well. And all the, ever since we've been using the church umbrella, uh, it's not possible for pastors to own any of their sermons. So every sermon that I've ever preached, or every tape, every audio, every YouTube video, is the property of the church. And, um, and basically, these are all ministers of the church, and now, every one of them has been subpoenaed to submit their sermons for the last three months. So we'll see what that's all about. Could be involving private thoughts and private minds, <laughs> which we talk a lot about, which is where all the guilt is, where all the contention and conflict. So it's getting deeper. This is a deep movie. <laughs> But some of you are ministers, and you're a minister. Most everyone. Jeffrey's pretty new. Is Jeffrey a minister? Oh, yeah. He's probably the only one safe. But <laughs> all of you, all, all of you, you're a minister. There's a young minister, 20, 23, 22. 22, but still subject to the laws of God. Okay, let's see where it goes. <laughs> in Houston. So now the government can determine what we can and can't preach at our churches. Let's not overreact. I'm so, with key turning point in the movie was God has a plan even though no matter how everything looked and it's interesting, it just dawned on me in seeing that movie again that uh, the very end of the trial they took, a, they took a play out of Mahatma Gandhi's playbook with the with the British I don't know if you ever remember seeing the movie Gandhi but basically, the British, with their white wigs, they tried him, and they basically used all of his writings in the trial to basically say, Mr. Gandhi, you wrote, and he wrote about freedom, he wrote about nonviolence, and all these things he wrote about. And at the end, they they pressured and pushed and pushed and pushed all these things that he had said <clears throat> where everything that he had written was in violation of the British laws for India. And then Gandhi said, if, if everything you have written and everything you have said that I have said is Sedition, that's what they charged him with, sedition. He held his hands up and he went. Then I am guilty as charged and must be put into prison immediately. <laughs> that popped it. That's what they did. You know, it was like a reverse strategy, but it was just coming to that point of, of having this, you have to invert a whole belief system to come back to innocence. And that's, I think that was great. Because I was sitting there thinking, where have I seen that that ploy <laughs> before <laughs> in action? And Gandhi actually used it, you know, as part of, you know, freeing the country of India from the British rule. You know, so it was good. Because she, he basically turned it around, so I thought that was great, but it really gets down to principles and... Uh, I think, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if it's still after the credits, we cut it off there, but I think there might be some more because the very, very end of the movie maybe, I think I've seen this as, as more of an answer to the Sarah's question. Because <laughs> I know I saw more than that. We might have to uh, go further there. We might have to see, because Sarah's still waiting to see <laughs> Where that correlation? So I think Nicholas, we may have cut it off too quick. <laughs> yeah. 
It's supposed to snow tomorrow. What? I love the whole Yeah, isn't it great? Snow! Yeah! Snow! <laughs> We're in Camus. <laughs> Where nothing is predictable. Including our movies. <laughs> you saw a squash growing outside. Yeah, we've oh, been touching harvest. Diana, I think, got the pretty most of the, the harvest. Yeah. The floodgates. These are all the cases. I'll see if it's on here. I know I remember seeing something, so we'll see whether I saw it in the theater or whether it got taken taken out of the movie or whatever. Let's see. Mm-hmm. What do we do now? Same as always, Martin. We pray. In faith. Part three. Part three is coming, Sarah. Part three. You'll get to see the whole, the whole case, <laughs> and all the reasonings and seeming arguments and all the different things. It's this whole idea that there's a government, a ruling body that has to protect. That's what we really got when we watched uh, Snowden. It's, and that's what we've seen too through our messengers over the years. And, and anywhere conflict arises at all, there's protectionism. Something needs to be protected. To be with projects, volunteers, could be with Protecting a country, protecting a body, protecting a group of people, doesn't really matter. You know, the answer is always in my defenselessness, my safety lies. It's coming to be convinced that there's nothing that needs protection. But that takes a wholehearted faith, and that's what that final song too that was leading into that was all about, you know, there's nothing to need to hide or hold back, you know. That's the only way you come to an experience that there's nothing to defend. And there's nothing to protect. Because it goes against all of our hero movies. What would Batman be without protectionism? What would Superman be? Wonder Woman? What would uh, Robin Hood be? What would all these great movies that people flock to see over and over and over be without protectionism? Wouldn't be any faith in the movies at all. They wouldn't be blockbusters, they wouldn't be anything. So it's, you know, that's, that's what these cases are seemingly playing out between universities and st Christian student unions and, and Christians and believers and non-believers and government and all these things. You know, you can just remember from the Course, truth does not fight against illusions, nor do illusions battle with the truth. Illusions battle only with themselves. And that's the only lesson there is to learn, that this was a world of complete illusion. There's not some that are bigger, stronger, superior, inferior, some, that, some illusions that win, some illusions that lose. Some illusions that succeed, some illusions that fail, they are all equally the same. And that experience is end of game. Game over. So 
So it's just curiosity. I'm sure God's Not Dead 3 will explore <laughs> how a government could subpoena sermons over the past three months. For what reason? What suspicion? doesn't really matter what the details are. I would guarantee you there's some form of protectionism going on in that prosecution. Yeah, I just couldn't understand why he just wouldn't, it was great, good news, more people want to hear my sermon. <laughs> I just couldn't understand why he wouldn't just give it to them. Just like tripod, almost identical. She's back. Same, this very same, same. He's like, it's crazy out here. He hasn't even seen the snow yet. <laughs> Our weather forecast for the night. Yeah, really good at getting down to the core of the teachings. Yeah, it is. Because the only thing she wasn't willing to share during the whole movie was the answer to who do you say that I am with him. She never said the answer in that meeting. Well, so I, I love that part. Yeah. Please, uh, Stand up. Yeah, because she somehow was hiding it herself, so I thought great. Yeah, it's always that way. The mind's playing hide and seek with itself, yeah. but, but you know, everything's a discernment lesson, and in the end, that the teacher of God can heal the world without a sound. So, in the end, the recognition of, of who I am is all that's required. And there's really, in the end, that's why there's no court cases required, there's no prosecution, there's no defense, there's no need to defend God. There's, you know, in the end, it's a recognition in the mind that that is what it's all about. And if there are situations where it seems to be there's a call to speak something, then, then you have to face any kind of fear that, that something could be lost or something could be harmed. I think in my... The parable of David, I do know that um, I remember traveling round and round doing all these talks and sharing and then Kathy Martin was my assistant and one time she said, uh, oh there's a message while you were gone, out traveling a message came in and you've been invited to speak at a church. There's nothing new about that, but I was invited to speak at Zion United Church of Christ the church where the body of David was confirmed, the church where I had to grow up and listen to all these sermons and go to many different meals and Founders Hall and all these kind of things. So it's quite interesting that that's what the invitation was, to come and speak at that church, which was more, again, orchestrated by God and the Holy Spirit to say, oh, you want to walk right back into anything that seems to be a past association you know how they say the hardest one to forgive is the one that's closest, that's most dear, you know, because of the meanings and associations with it. So, I was like, what did you say the, the name of the church was? Zion's United Church of Christ. It turns out that my biological father had, because the, the minister had been on, had gone through a near-death experience, I don't know if he'd been on Oprah at that point, but he'd written extensively, he's preaching, working into his his sermons, and and basically, yeah, I was in, he decided to uh, hold a class in the church on mysticism and saints, the, the mystics and the saints, in a standard Christian Protestant church. So Jack started going to the things, and he learned about St. Teresa of Avila, and he learned St. Francis, and he was listening to all the mystics and saints, Christian, basically a lot of Christian saints and everything. And then finally, at some point during these weeks of class, Jack was like, oh, 
my son David is uh, is one of them. <laughs> one of what? The minister said. And then Jack said, I think I think you should invite him to come to this class, come to the church. And the minister said, minister said, he's always welcome, everyone is welcome. And Jack said, because he's one of them. One of what? I mean, he just couldn't. He was teaching a class on all the great mystics and saints, but he couldn't comprehend the question. <laughs> what? One of what? He's welcome, but what are you talking, what are you talking about? So, when I did go there, uh, they had a, a, a meal there, and um, um, the minister was showing slideshows and, and films of, uh, of his trip to Belize, where he went down to help people rebuild and like Habitat for Humanity build and and as he kept showing the the uh, slides of these children in Belize, they all were beaming and smiling, all were happy. And it was the the minister's daughter who said, "What are you doing in Belize, Dad? You're not helping them. Look at them, fa look at their faces." They don't need help. And he was like, oh, you know, again, these are deep lessons. But but also, after um, I, there he was there, and, and some people had a big meal, and some stayed behind and for me, and he came to me and he said, um, <coughs> well, I would like to be here while you're here, but I have to go visit a, a pastor, a minister, who's been diagnosed with cancer. So he smiled at me and he said, So I leave my flock to you. And out he goes. And then I just went, gave talks in that church like I give at any, any location, or here in this room. I just went deeper and deeper and deeper and God didn't create this world and just let the Spirit come through. I have nothing to protect nothing to defend, and I had no association with that place as being any different than any other. So that's the one where it went deeper and deeper and deeper into a stillness. We just went, it took us so deep into this deep stillness. And then as we went into the stillness, it got very, it was just all stillness. And finally, after a while of just complete stillness in Zion United Church of Christ, then one of the elderly women of the congregation said, spoke up and broke the stillness and said, Who is speaking to us now? She said. And there was such a quietness and such a stillness and such a, the I Am Presence was so strong that I felt no need to give a word or a name to it. But, my biological father, Jack, was on hand and he looked around at his wife and his daughter and the whole congregation of his church and he went, Jesus, Jesus is speaking to us now. And on the inside I thought, that's the end of the world. <laughs> that's it. It's over. <laughs> oh, it's official. <laughs> I thought, it's official. When your biological father says that in front of his wife and daughter and the congregation, and the minister's gone, and I went, I thought, there's no more I can speak. <laughs> you can't top that. <laughs> so, that's the, that's the answer. Who, that's what this movie is about. Who do you say that I am? And then she said, I heard Jesus speak to me, so... That's like the unspeakable thing in a courtroom, but that was what the, her attorney felt was <laughs> absolutely necessary, you know, was the one thing that's unspeakable, which 
Of course, this whole world was made to cover that over. You know, the the world does the ego doesn't want that question ever to be asked because it asked the first question. That was the first question ever asked was what am I? It's a little too risky when you get down to that point to the original question because behind the original question is the original experience of reality. The ego doesn't want that. Oh. <laughs> reminds me, this movie reminds me of an Al Pacino movie from many, many years, an old Al Pacino movie, Injustice for All, where at the very end of the movie, he, Al Pacino, speaks to the jury, speaks to the whole crowd, and turns around, and he's. He gets up and he goes, they're, they're slamming the gavel saying, you're out of order. Because he just starts speaking in an unfiltered way in the courtroom. And then Pacino goes, I'm out of order. He looks at the crowd, you're out of order. He looks at the jury, he says, you're out of order. He turns right over to the judge and he says, and you're out of order. He points to the whole thing and says, you're out of order. And I was telling him, few people, Francis, I think, that um, Jennifer Aniston was just on Good Morning America, and yeah, she, they were, uh, started to question her and quiz her about the divorce Angelina. of Angelina Jolie and her ex-husband. Oh, they questioning right, Jennifer. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah on Good yeah, Morning America, and she, oh, she lost it. Then. She lost it. She was like, she turned furious and angry, and she said, you're asking me about this when, uh, you know, a, a black man held his hands up, it was on the nightly news at that, that very same day, he held his hands up and, and was shot in Tulsa and killed, and you're, you, you have the nerve, and she just, on Good Morning America, <laughs> Just like with Julia Roberts, Miss Goody Two Shoes, and the one that everyone loves the most, she's like, Fuck society! She starts <laughs> ranting and raving and just firing it out like, how dare you ask about that when we've got things that we need to deal with. She said, what about people? Where are the people? How can this happen? You know, she's just venting her rage. <laughs> rage against the machine. <laughs> but coming from, you know. From Jennifer Aniston, I, I could just see people at home who tune in for the last 35, 40 years rushing to get their remote. Get the kids! Oh my God! Turn it off! Turn it off! <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's what that whole song was, the last song that we saw. Mm. You know, you have to speak it up. Mm. You can't stuff it down, it's not going away. And after we did our show, Out of the Blue Comes Francis Zoo, then yeah, our friend Dan wrote to me email titled, Rage. Mm. That was the title of the email, Rage. And he can feel it when he's golfing, when he's out doing the everyday ordinary things, he can feel under the surface. It's down there, it's bubbling. And, and that song at the end there was perfect for that. It was a perfect, no people pleasing, no private thoughts. In fact, a theme song, an anthem almost, yeah. at the end there. Very beautiful lyrics. Mm-hmm. Those could be like printed out, or the mm-hmm. song could be sung at the beginning of expression sessions. Mm-hmm. Lest you forget how important it is and think it's just another day, you could play that song at the end, how important it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that we practice those those principles. Yeah, I noticed one of the lines said, "Go out there and riot," and I noticed I thought that was strange, but I guess if you do, if you don't raise your despair, your frustration, your rage, and your anger authentically, exactly as it's coming, then even the purity of the silent response that you're also talking about can't. 
Be yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Jennifer Aniston did on Good Morning America. She raised the riot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was quoted <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, if you wanted a heartwarming video, I, I, early this morning I got up and I, I went in before the internet went out and I was, I posted that uh, George Harrison song mm. and uh, then they have all these other suggested songs and they put his last appearance his last performance so I was like oh what was that so I clicked on that and it, he stopped by VH1 with his friend Ravi Shankar to promote Ravi's but it was like a 41 minute video but oh my god I just had tears of joy watching it and listening to it because Oh, it was so profound. It's so much right. That was back in 1997, but it's so much what, what is right here amongst us right now. George Harrison coming on there. It was just a few people that were going to get some sound bites to do a little PR thing. And he started talking about, he said, I, I'm quite confused when I look at the world because I see people running around and so busy. And all of these years of my life have showed me for what? There's nothing, nothing to do, nothing to pursue. He said, the only question is, is, what is death and how do I escape from it? He said, that's absolutely the only thing worth focusing your mind on and looking at, and nothing else. And then um, he started talking about the essence, we have an essence, and it, our essence sees the world perfectly, it's always been perfect, and that's our whole point, is to find, to find that. There's no other point to life. And, uh, mm. and he started to really, the spirit was just ripping through him on VH1, just ripping. And then the young, like, VJ that had invited him on there was just like, and then George just looked him in the eye and said, I hope I'm not being too transcendental. <laughs> Uh, and, the, and the young VJ was like, no, you're not. And inviting him to go more, and he just, he said, he said, yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. And, and he just spoke, he just channeled spirit, 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 spirit. And then, um, finally, a woman who had come in, who, who had followed him in, George in, was one of the VH, the H1 staff had brought in a guitar. And so she stuck the guitar, or they brought the guitar over, and they, they thought it was George's guitar, but it was just this woman who showed up on the spot with this tiny little PR promotion with the guitar. So he's, they had, didn't even know if he would stay. He, he didn't do television appearances, but they gave him the guitar, and he did an impromptu concert, taking requests and singing. And then um, I, I listened to his profound songs, and he was having so much fun, and one after the other, other, and they all were just like totally swept up in it, and it was so precious. And then I, I just waited. I was laying in my bed to hear what's okay. This is his last appearance on earth. What's what's it going to be? What's the final song he's going to spontaneously perform? And it was about all all things pass away. And I was like, oh, it was just like, it was putting an end to a glorious lifetime and a glorious career by singing All Things Pass Away. And mm. it was just so precious. And then hitting the last note of that song just perfectly. And yeah, it was such a strong, 41 minutes, but so strong. I was in there just for that little video today. And then, of course, I posted the other one, Give Me Love, Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth, in Maryland over in Holland. She said, I'm going to learn that song and on the guitar and play it. So it just kind of rippled out across yeah. the ocean and over to Europe and wherever. Very sweet. Give me love, give me love, give me peace on earth. 
Give me life, give me life, keep me free as a bird. Give me hope, help me cope with this heavy load. And I ain't through trying to reach you with heart and soul. As Sweetie climbs to the top. <laughs> Perched. Dry, clean, on top of the world. Safe in the flood. Safe <laughs> and clueless. Ha, ha, ha.